December, double check me. Um, but we need to understand what what it is and what's going on. You guys have um, have you done any research on this? No. Yes. All right. I want you to go. Guys, no, the only way you're gonna know is go and double check just to make sure everything that I'm telling you is obviously reliable. Go and double check me on what, what's going on. First thing I will mention about Hanukkah, it is not one of God's high holy days. This is a tradition. It is a time of remembrance, much like Purim, the Feast of Esther. Okay? It's a nice time to remember what God did, but it is not prescribed. Okay? So if you want to celebrate it, you want to remember it, okay. If you don't, okay. Right? I do, however, we need to lay some grand rules here before we even start this discussion. Is that this is not as someone has dubbed it, Christmas. <laughs> we are not confusing Christmas with Hanukkah. Okay? This is not a replacement to Christmas. Because we don't celebrate Christmas, we don't celebrate Christmas because it's not publicly based. Okay? We've taken a step away from that. This is not now the replacement thereof. This just so happens to be at that time, around the time of year, sometimes it will overlap. Okay, just like Pesach and Easter. Okay, sometimes it will overlap, sometimes it won't. Right, what we do need to understand that this has biblical basis, just like Purim, but it's not prescribed. Okay? And then we obviously just have to discuss, we'll discuss the origins of it. I'll give you the, 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 the short and sweet version. No, you said to get back. I'm going to terrorize you about Leviticus. No. And then you can, and then you can, you know, you as a family sit down and discuss it and decide what you want to do. Because there are obviously things in it like gift giving that we need to analyze. We need to look at where they get it from and, you know, where's the balance. All right? I think it's a beautiful time of year. Um, but that's about remembrance, okay? It's about remembering what God has done, all right? So, can anybody tell me what does Hanukkah mean? What feast is it? Dedication. Right, it is about dedication. All right, in the history, if we can go and double check, okay? Basically, we have two sources to give us the story of Hanukkah, okay? You guys, have any of you heard of the Book of the Magnus? Yes. Right, okay, it's considered an apocryphal book. Okay, an apocryphal book is a bunch of books that were kind of not included in our canon. A canon is a collection of books folded into one book. This is a canon. Right? You do not have one book here, you have 66 different books here. Which is why every time you open up a book, we look at context, we look at history, we look at foundations, you look at customs, what was going on in that time, at this place, with the specific people, so you get the fullness of what's going on. Yes, it has a common theme, which is God. Yes, it is God's story, but it's God's story written by different authors spanning over thousands of years. Alright? If he had to add a book in here today, what current day customs would he use to help the, the readers in that understand what's going on? Is that making sense? Okay? So, when we look back at this book of Maccabees, it is backed up historically, but because it doesn't mention God, okay, they've left it out of God's story. Alright? There are underlying factors that make it a miraculous time. But we have to search the Talmud for the miraculous event, which is further reapproved what happened in this time in the Maccabees. Okay? So basically the story goes like this. Alexander the Great 
comes down. Greek general conquers all the way up to Babylon and stops his fight at the, at, the, at the borders of Asia, right? We've seen the movies. Okay? Eventually, young general gets sick. He dies. He has four major boikis underneath him. And they split up Alexander the Great's kingdom to four different provinces, if you can put it this way. But as Alexander the Great was coming through to go up to Babylon and take over all the thing all the way down to Egypt, he came into Jerusalem and tradition has it that he was kind of, he was a very powerful man but very sneaky in his ways. All right? He didn't come in like a conquering hero. He walked up and it says, tradition has it that he came up to the high priest and he bowed. Alright, so now this is new. This is the first time a conquering hero comes up, takes all over the land, and then he bows to the high priest. So they stop and they go, okay, what do you want? And he goes, I did not come to oppress you. I came to share my way of life while I'm taking over this region. Alexander. Alexander the Great. Okay, so all I expect from you, I do not wish you to stop your religion or anything like that. I want you to practice it. All I want to do as king and ruler over these lands is bring my way, our ways, the modern world, to your land, and then we can live together in harmony. So the high priest is thinking, okay, we've, we've been conquered. This isn't a bad deal. We can keep our temple. We can keep our practices. This is going okay. What they didn't understand about Hellenism, have you guys heard this phrase before? Okay, Hellenistic thinking, Greek thinking, the Greek mindset. Greek thinking, have you guys seen Alexander the Great or have you seen that movie Alexander with Colin, was it Colin Farrell? Mm -hmm. Alright, it's, uh, yeah, it gets a little bit below the belt at times, but it's a very accurate description. You'll have man pretty boys with him and then they'll be like, oh you did wonderful out on the battlefield to stroke his generous hair. That is not a fanciful depiction, this is historically accurate, alright? In Greek mindset or Greek thinking, you know, it wasn't uncommon at all that, um, put it this way, ladies were for pleasure, uh, ladies were for babies, boys were for pleasure. Okay? This was normal. This is the custom. They had idols everywhere. Zeus. Um, many, many of the, the Roman gods, when you start talking about Dionysus and Artemis and what, what, actually are just renamed Greek gods, okay? Hellenistic thinking actually infiltrated Rome and, and became Roman thinking, all right? So they were very, very distorted, as you can imagine. They never had any idea of unclean and clean. They never had any idea of what was right and wrong according to marriage. They had never an idea about a lot of things that came to a God-fearing, Torah-observant nation. Now all of a sudden you start bringing these busts in, these idols and this and that and all the rest of it. Alexander dies and then there's a man, his general's name was Antiochus IV or Antiochus Epiphanes, came into power over that region. Eh? What is your fifth? I'll go and check that. But Antiochus Epiphanes came in and he was in charge. And he did things a little bit differently. All right, he was basically saying, okay, here's a piece of pork, eat the pork so you can convert, or I kill you. Very simple. All right, eventually they were forcing conversion to Hellenistic ways instead of allowing the people the freedom of what Alexander the Great did. And eventually there was a priest, a high priest by the name of Matitiayu, who decided enough's enough. They came to his village, they tried to force people to convert. He said, not on my watch, my boy, and he actually got the little village together and actually struck down the guys who were forcing people to convert. Yeah. His son carries on the revolt by the, a guy by the name of Judah. Okay, they call him Judah the Maccabee, which is literally Judah the Hammer. All right? A priestly family goes to war and miraculously kicks the butt of this serious Greek force that has taken over under Antiochus Epiphanes and they drive them out. Now some of the atrocities that Antiochus was doing at that time, let me, let me list a, a few of these. He established his own Hellenistic high priest on temple, in Temple Mount. Okay? He banned the study of Torah, he sacrificed pigs on the altars, and I actually heard one story that he actually took a bust 
of, I think it was Zeus, and they actually put it inside the temple itself. Okay, so all nice, good, kosher things that were going on there. So obviously this high priest really got annoyed, and there was a line drawn in the sand. You are literally defiling the place where God told us he would meet with us. And if he is not there, how are we supposed to have communion with him? How are we supposed to remember the covenant with him? How are we supposed to worship him in the right manner? So a miraculous thing happens, they kick them all out. And then they come up and they start going, all right, God has granted us a great victory, what do we do next? They get hold of the temple and they start fixing it up and they start rededicating. Okay? Now anything that was used in the temple was kind of like ripped to shreds or, or thrown out okay, by the Greeks. What happened was they found one, what they call one cruise of oil. It was enough oil to light the menorah. Okay? Remember the way we, we lit the menorah, it has little lamps on top here. You would fill it up and then you would have your wicks, right? You had enough to light the menorah for one day. But we have a problem. It would take eight days for the next pure oil to be manufactured. We have to go pick, we have to roll the millstone over, we have to crack, we have to pack it in place, we have to wait. And it's only the extra virgin oil that you could use. So, eight days, what do we do now? Do we wait eight days? Don't we wait eight days? Do we light it now? Can we do this? The place is ready, we need to dedicate it. We want God in our lives. How do we get there? So what happened is, and this is where it goes from the Maccabees into the Talmud, it is recorded that they decided they were going to light the lights. They were going to light the menorah even if it was only for one day. And this to me is one of the biggest things about Hanukkah that really brings a heart about it. They would rather, remember what this represented. God's presence. God's presence light. The seven spirits. Seven spirits of God made out of what? Pure gold. Pure gold, which represented what? Righteousness. Righteousness. God is pure righteousness, His very presence that brings light and life into our lives in His temple. And He uses this to show them something very beautiful. They go, we are not going to go another day without having that in this temple. I just get a little goosebumpy when I start thinking of people having that much desire to have God live among them. We've cleaned out the house. We've kicked out those people. We want this relationship. And what happens is he brings it up and God does something miraculous. He makes the oil last for eight days. Just long enough to be able to get the new batch in. Sort of a reminder of the manna from heaven. When they crossed over the border into the promised land, the manna stopped. They only needed it while they were, going in the, world, while they were in the wilderness. Because that's where you needed that specific type of provision. Okay? He reminds them, because you have reached out, you've drawn unto me, I will draw unto you. Okay? My spirit will dwell with you. Okay? So we've got a couple of cool images. Any questions about the story? No? Alright. We've got a couple of cool little things that go on in this, in this thing now. You get a Chanukia, which is basically a menorah. A menorah is a lampstand, right? But a Chanukia has two extra branches that come out, right? And they have the central candle, which is called the Shamash candle, the, the servant candle, right? Now, when they light the lights, they always light the Shamash candle first, okay? The servant is lit. There is life. There is fire. Then they would take the servant candle and then they would start lighting Day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six. Okay? Every aspect of this. Sorry. Every aspect of this. Every aspect of this just screams Messiah. That is the same as when God. Yeshua brings forth truth and light and life. He comes up and then he goes from my flame to Regan and then to Rachel, then to Uncle Tony, 
into Auntie Elsie, into Kevin, into Dave. And so it carries on. And one of the craziest things, like when you start off, like, if you guys are going to do this exercise, switch off all the lights. Every time you light the candle, switch off the lights. And I imagine this is what's going on in Israel at that time. There is no life, there is no God, there is only these people. We cleanse it out, we put it into place, and then the servant is lit. And then there's a little bit of light in this very dark place. Then all of a sudden, the more people who start to rededicate not only the temple, but themselves to God because they want to worship, they want to get this going, it gets a little bit brighter every time. And every night as it goes on, God's presence starts to fill more and more and more. And at this time of remembrance, we can remember the miracles that have taken place. We can enjoy this wonderful feast. And funny enough, you know, we have a New Testament reference about this feast. Okay? If you guys will turn with me quickly to John, so John chapter 10, verse 22. <coughs> Sorry. John 10, verse 22. <coughs> the Feast of Dedication. Okay? Notice, nowhere else in Scripture will you hear about the Feast of Dedication. This was, this happened when? When did Hanukkah happen? Winter. Winter, but I'm talking about timeline. Was it New Testament timing, Old Testament timing? New Testament. 65 BC. Hmm? 65 BC. Uh, it would have been old. The first one. Yes. It was 166 BC. 168 This is actually in between Old and New Testament. Trick question. Okay? This is what happened in what they call the silent years. There's a period of 400 years in between the Old and the New Testament when they said God was quiet. And this was going on. Okay? God is never really quiet, it's just that certain things that were falling into place needed to happen so that Yeshua could come at the right time. Okay? But you know, so this is, they were really celebrating this, or remembering this in New Testament. It came the Feast of Dedication, Hanukkah in Yerushalayim. Where was Yeshua based? Where did He live? Where did He live? Uh, no, no, that's, that's where he grew up. Capernaum. Capernaum. Okay. His main base was Capernaum. Right? He was a Galilean. And here we find him in Jerusalem. This is exactly nowhere near Sukkot. He didn't go up for a feast and then just while he was there, you know, okay, I'll stay an extra three days. When was the Feast of Tabernacles? How long ago was that? It's been a while, yes? Yes. So, in my mind, if it's important enough for Yeshua to make the track up to Jerusalem to remember a feast, a memorial time, we need to pay attention. Okay? It was winter, which is obviously what's going to happen now. Yeshua was walking around inside the temple area in Shlomo's colonnade, Solomon's portico. So the Judeans surrounded him and said to him, how much longer are you going to keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us publicly. Yeshua answered them, I have already told you and you don't trust me. The works I do in my Father's name testify on my behalf. But the reason you don't trust is that you, do not, you are not included among my sheep. Now there's a very funny tradition that is still going on today. They call it, they actually recite in the, in the Siddur, a Jewish prayer book. Okay? Now remember, this is prayers that are written down from the oral tradition that have been going on for centuries. There's two types of prayers. One is the Halal, the Halal Psalms. Okay, so in your Bibles you'll see the Halal Psalms and you'll see the Psalms of Ascent. Okay, there were Psalms that as you were ascending to Jerusalem, you would sing the Halal, uh, they sing the Psalms of Ascent as you were going up. 
When you got to Jerusalem, you will recite the Halal song as in, Hallelujah, praise God, we have arrived. And we are here. We are in the place of your presence. And, they, and the second portion of this is in a prayer that they recite at this time called al Hanasim, which is um, about the miracles. What does Yeshua say? The works that I have done. Mm. You are standing in a place remembering the miracles of what God the Father had done. Yeshua, who is the one of the world, Lord. He is the light who brings life. He is pure righteousness. Standing in Jerusalem at a time remembering this very act. What did God multiply? Well. Oil. And the Mashiach, the anointed one, is standing in their presence. You are anointed with oil. He is the one who poured himself out on our behalf. Standing there in this time and they're going to go, Are oh, you him? And he's like, if you remember this work, how can you not look around and see all that I am doing? And not realize who you're talking to. He uses Hanukkah not only as a memorial, as a time of remembrance, but also a time to say, remember the works that God has done. Uh, how long before um, before this happened was uh, the Maccabean story? Well, they gauge. I think it was like what I want to say, but the revolt happened and the rededication was 165 BC. So you can say 160, maybe 200 years, give or take. Okay, because at that stage, he's probably, remember, he, we believe he only started his public ministry when he was 30. Alright, so he would be 30 years, and then if you can take it on the thing, or whatever, there's a discrepancy. It wasn't actually zero on 180, it was about 280 or 380 that they believe he was actually born. <coughs> So, more or less, okay? So, you've, you've got about 160, uh, well, 180 and 200 years of practice going on here before of remembrance. And he's standing in there going, this whole thing was about me. You wanted my presence to dwell among you. Here is Emmanuel. You wanted my spirit to dwell in this place, you wanted to see pure righteousness, you rededicated yourself and you asked me who I am? Boy, keep looking around, you're obviously missing the point. Okay? If it was important enough for Yeshua to go to Jerusalem, which is an arduous journey, it's important enough for me to pay attention. Alright? So, we've taken the time, and this is a time of remembrance, this is a time specifically for me of rededication, where I sit and I remember that it is because of God's light in my life that servant candle is lit. And every time I light the candle, there was someone who was lit before me eventually got to a place where I was brought to life. That I can now celebrate the miracles of what God has done. And now I understand who He is in His forms. Okay? It's a beautiful time. Alright? Any questions about that? All good. Alright. Wait. That's just what I'm going to address now. Okay. But I wanted to ask that gamble game about the game. Yes, okay, we'll, okay. we'll discuss it again. Alright, there's two traditions that come along with Hanukkah. Besides lighting the Hanukkah, they give gifts. Alright, and this is where people get, including Jewish peeps, get a little bit confused. They jump up and down and they go, it's because of Christmas that now presents are given. Or other people who are celebrating Christmas going, and they're going to be looking at you. If you choose, again, you guys need to listen to, I'm going to give you the different, the different hands. You make up your own mind. They will go, oh, well, now you're just replacing one day of Christmas, and now you're giving eight-day presents. Yeah. So I'm watching your story here. Trying to pull a fast one. Instead of just getting one-day presents, now you've gone to your parents into giving you eight-day presents, right? Mm -hmm. Very clever, yes. Alright? They're saying you're just replacing, you're taking Christmas and you're taking Hanukkah and you're mixing and matching the two. That is not the case. I will reiterate, this is a time of dedication. It 
just falls somewhere between. It's like when we celebrate Pesach and the Ark, while well, you're just swapping Easter for Passover. It doesn't fly. One has political base, historical base, one is completely pagan. Okay? Now, there are different interpretations of this. Okay? Now, we need to understand that the custom in the time, remember if you go back to Purim, Esther, all right? After the people fought off all of what was it, Cyrus's, well, Haman's decree, but it was, you know, through Cyrus, and now they had to defend themselves, and it was going to be the complete annihilation of everything Jewish in the entire Persian population. After they defended themselves and they celebrated, they gave gifts. Okay, now, this is a very odd thing. We're celebrating that we're alive and they gave gifts, okay? So, publicly, we have an actual example for any sort of celebration. They celebrate together by blessing each other, all right? There are a couple of different interpretations, right? What they call is, what they call Hanukkah is they call Hanukkah Gelt, all right? It sounds very similar to money. It is money, all right? What they do is they, instead of giving presents, they give money to children, okay? Or they give of money. Now, one of the things that, one of the reasons they do this is because they say, you know, the word Hanukkah actually comes from the same root as education. And because at this time it has become a time of Torah study, because, remember, Antiochus prohibited any Torah study, we have to re-educate the people. We have to explain to them what is right, what is wrong, where everybody falls in line. Okay? So as a reward for your studiousness, have a present. Okay? That's one interpretation. Another interpretation is, by celebrating what God has done for you, give to those who are in need. And in many examples they say, we start with our community. Alright? If someone is too poor to celebrate Hanukkah, what do they do? First thing we have to make sure is you need candles. Okay? So we make sure that the poor person, if he cannot afford to have wine and candles and he only has to buy candles, by me celebrating what God has done for me, I give him money, he's able to buy the Kiddush wine and we are able to celebrate together. It is a mitzvah or a traditional instruction, not a God's instruction, I need to make that clear. Then when you light the Hanukkah, you light the lights and you stick it in the window for everybody to see. Okay? So when they put the Hanukkah in the window, it was purely to say we are remembering the miracles of God that have passed. We are celebrating this memorial where God had allowed us to draw near to Him and come close so that we could, you know, remember this covenant. Alright? Even though other people stood in our way. Okay, so they didn't have curtains. Well, you remember in the winters in those days, we were like holding a wall. Okay, now, you, you make, 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 make ties, okay? So, they, yeah, they would give to the poor so that they would be able to celebrate more. Every time we go to Passover and things like that, you'll see on a lot of these websites, and even when you go to Israel, there will be guys walking around going, Sedeka, 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 which means give of righteousness, give me money. That's what they're asking. Because they want you to buy a basket so that other people can celebrate Pesach. If you don't have food, how am I supposed to throw out the chametz so that I can go buy matzah? Makes, makes the mitzvah very, very difficult. So they say, give us money, we will give them matzah and everything they need so that they can celebrate this time. Okay? Another thing, instead of money, a lot of people say, okay, right, we will give of terms of education or something godly. I will buy you a talit, pressure. I will buy you a Bible, a chumash, a Torah scroll. I'll buy you a commentary. I'll buy you a worship CD. I will buy you something so to remind you what we're doing here. It's about God. It's about His presence. But we're celebrating the fact of what He has done. Okay? Another more plausible one is that we've got, well, let me give you two. Okay? <coughs> In number seven, when the chieftains came up to them building the tabernacle, they gave gifts, okay, as to the tabernacle. So, as a celebration, they gave what God had gave, all right? And this comes from the spoils of war. They walked outside of Egypt with all the spoils of Egypt, and they walked outside, Torah says, by in legion for legion, or troop for troop, okay, in groups, marching as a victorious army, 
outside of this. And now we're going, okay, they're marching out like conquering heroes, but God did all the work. I want you to understand that as my people, the victory is mine, but I share it with you. And they walked out with the spoils of. Okay? Now in the book of Maccabees in chapter 3, verse 41, it talks about that they took the, the spoils of, the, of war. Okay? And that was distributed among the soldiers who fought the fight and also the people. So they had coins, they had clothes, they had this, they took territory, and then soldiers didn't go, no, well, you didn't fight, you can't have any of it. They blessed everybody by it. Because what the Greeks did was they took their possessions and they defiled them. Okay, so a lot of the things that they could have used, they had to clean, they had to get right, then they had to restore. So partly by restoring, they took the spoils of war and they gave gifts to everybody so that they could now celebrate with God and not just look at bad stuff that happened. Okay? We, there's also one last thought is that any gift that you give now, I'm thinking, you know, in the line of buying a talit, buying a mezuzah, buying something like that, that's going to remind you of what's going on. It is basically a gift offering unto God. You don't have a temple, you cannot go give a gift offering to God, so what do you do? You bless the people around you. Alright? So you go up to the people and you say, I want you to know that because we're celebrating this time, I want you to keep your focus on God, therefore I'm giving you a gift. Bottle question. Alright? This is traditionally where the different sides come from. This isn't, okay, let's just celebrate 12 gifts because it's Christmas time and we don't celebrate Christmas so we're replacing it. Okay, everything that they have looked into has got biblical basis or cultural basis at least. Okay, that we can go back and we can look to, like I said, the time of Esther, when it was all said and done, they declared a festival that would be proclaimed throughout the territories forever. This is why Jews celebrate Purim at this time. Or not at this time, but they celebrate Purim, and they give gifts. They give gifts to the poor, they give gifts to each other, they celebrate with a giving heart because God had given them freedom in life. Okay, it's not just about presents and it's not just all about you and what you want, it is about the giving. And remember, Yeshua says, you know, you proclaim a fast, and what type of fast do you want? Do you want to walk around and you're moping and you're all gunky and all the rest of it? Or do you go out and you feed the needy and you bless the poor and you go talk to those who are in need? I believe that falls in line with giving of the gifts, especially to the people around you who are struggling at this time. Consider it maybe an extra tithe. Consider it maybe inviting people to your table that you know, okay, look, um, I don't think any of us are like Baruch Hashem really struggling to put food on the table. But you invite the people into your home and you say, you know what? This is about God. I want you to celebrate with us. I'm going to bless you with a five course meal. Whatever. That's the giving that is supposed to take place. Okay? It's not just about the presents. It's nice to receive presents, yes. But if we were going to put a guideline to this, if you want to give presents, maybe give something in line that, that would further them in maybe their studies or worship or something along those lines. You know, get your kiddies, little kiddies Bibles or little bookmarks or coloring books or a little kiddie DVD or something like that. It is about God, first and foremost. Okay? Any questions, any thoughts? Oh wait, you want to chat about the yeah, game? The game. And the game is like basically a spinning top. Now the spinning top represents, it's got a couple of letters on either side, which comes down to Chinook, which talks about education. So it's trying to get them involved about why do we do this? Oh, let me teach you while I teach you to play a game. Because they weren't allowed to do that. Um, the, they weren't allowed to study Torah. And then, can I say, just share that history with them? They weren't allowed to do it. So when, that, when the people came around that um, wanted to, you know, play them out, they would pretend to play, play gambling games. Is not gambling wrong? It's not gambling. It's, it's, they would play spinning top and then we'd use it as Basically, if it lands on this letter, what, 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 this would go in place. I don't know exactly the entire rules of all the games, but the edge of the heart behind it is to teach them about it. Okay? I wouldn't get hung up on all that stuff. To me, it's not about the game. You're not hiding from Torah anymore. Yeah, yeah no, but it's, there's a nice story behind it. So, I mean, I was just yes. thinking of doing, when we do this, every night, teach a little bit of the history, and then maybe one night play the game, and one night do this, so that they can see the whole... You, the children might be more can, interested. You can. Remember, the heart behind it was, okay, let me disguise something so I can, it looks like we're just playing spinning top, but actually what we're doing is I'm teaching you about the mitzvot of God. The mitzvot of God. 
Okay, because it was literally, we catch a bird, we come in here, we walk in here, you open up a Bible, we have a discussion, you find somebody and you go, I don't, really don't understand this chapter and verse, what are you talking about here? You, be, you know, you walk into any mall, they've got, you know, gospel direct or room or whatever like that, and you can just go and you pick up a Bible anytime you want. Go to CNA, you can buy a Bible. There, no more Bible, no more God. We are your gods. You will worship Zeus. Ah, oh, you think it's unkosher to put a pig on the altar. Let me defile your house to make sure your God will never return. They never took possession of the temple. They never broke it down and tore it away. They defiled it. It's like someone taking your Bible and then using it as new paper. And they go, where's your God? And you start to understand why they went to war. Enough's enough. They would rather risk their lives and have God than not. I believe that's something that we need to take seriously, especially in our times. But also, remember what these people sacrificed just so they could light in the world. Remind us our freedom. Remind us where we are. Remind us that this represents Yeshua. And He was at least in Jerusalem at that time to go and remind them and use it as a teaching aid to get these people on the right page. Okay? Alright, so again, if you want to celebrate it, great. If you don't want to celebrate it, great. Okay? It's up to you and your house to decide. This is not a pre-described high holy day by God. But this is something I believe we need to at least remember at a time that happened and we go, you know what, if we can remember, <coughs> sure, if we can have Heritage Day, which is Bright Day. You know, I'm pretty sure we can remember something that God did like this and, you know, set it a little bit, little bit apart from being common. Okay. Alright. Okay, let's get into the portion. You guys have done nice homework for me. Leviticus. Yeah. The book of Viking The book of Yes, it is. Okay, remember, last week we laid the foundation. We laid the foundation and we said, okay. This is a book pertaining to the Levites, the priesthood. And it is something extremely important that applies to you because it talks about in 1 Peter, it says, you are a kingdom of priests. Okay? We are a holy priesthood. How are you even supposed to understand the fullness of that statement unless you understand what the Levites were called to do? What is their job? How does it, how does it happen? Now there's something very interesting about what happens here. Okay, we finish off the book of Exodus on a bit of a cliffhanging note. God says, build the tabernacle. And in the middle of it, remember, there was the Shabbat and the Shabbat. Okay, remember, when he started the instructions uh, for, no, well, when he finished the instructions, the first run of, I think it's Exodus 31, talking about the tabernacle, he ended on Shabbat. And in this portion, talks about other stuff, and then he goes, Shabbat, remember this, this, and this, and this is how you'll do it. And it's an actual reiteration of, of what they, what God instructed, they did through Betzalel and Olio. Okay? And the people gave, and it was exciting, and then we had the funny little prohibition that says you will not kindle the fire. Okay? And in the midst of it, we discussed, well, the only thing that happened in between there and there was the golden calf. Alright? So we had two applications to this. The kindling of fire, according to the context of what was going on, was when you become impatient, do not make for yourself an idol. Shabbat is about my day, it's about holy day, it's about remembering that I created everything, number one. Number two, even the tabernacle, making the tabernacle come second to Shabbat. You will not kindle a fire so that Betzalel can make the stuff, remember all the steel, all the melting, all the forging that had needed to take place by this man and the people he was underneath him, he says, no, no, no. Even creating the tabernacle, you won't work on Shabbat. It's done. Okay? You will rest on my back and remember that what I created, 
in heaven, on earth, and all the rest of it, I am the creator. And what you're making is a copy of what I created in heaven. Does that make any sense? Remember, everything that he gave in the tabernacle, he said, you will do this, Moses, you will do this as what he saw. Okay? So when you look at those visions um, that they have, like Isaiah and, and things like that, when, he, when they go to heaven, there will be the throne flanked by two angels. You will have the altar that, uh, that the, the angel took, if we're looking at Isaiah, they took the, with tongs, picked up a coal and took it to Isaiah, and he purified his mouth. Put it on his lips and he says, now you are pure. Carbon copy, what he gave you was a foreshadow of what is up there. Okay? That's just on one level. Let's not get, even get started with the whole, how you are the tabernacle. Okay, we've done this. Alright. So we have the carbon copy of what's going on here. Now you have this, tabernacle is now made and then it stops. And then the term, Vayikha, this letter here in Hebrew, Vav, does what? It means and. So it's linking Exodus, the previous portion, to. The cliffhanger is this. I want you, I want to dwell with you, I'm going to be with you, everything is going to be set up so that we can, you can draw near to me and not be scared about death or anything like that because I'm holy and I'm righteous and I'm pure. How are we going to do that? Above makes the link. This is how we're going to get this right. There are going to be specific offerings that, I'm, that I want from you to allow you to draw near to me. Now remember the word for offering is korban. Okay. Korban that it came from the same root karav, which means to draw near to. So every time you hear of an offering, the heart behind that offering is how am I going to draw near to God? Okay? When we look at sin, such a, sin literally means, in the ancient pictographic Hebrew, a strong fence. Something that separates God and me. So we're going to give you a set of offerings so that you can draw near to me. And I'm in this place that is there going through the pictures of how these things are going to take place. Now we need to understand, there are a couple of <coughs> major pictures that are in play here. Okay? Let's talk about, before you guys tell me all about the offerings, let's talk about um, what it is, let me ask a question. Does sacrifice or these offerings bring salvation? No scriptural basis to if you do this, you will be saved for eternity. No. Okay. So it's important to note that this is not something that's going to be your eternal salvation. This is about what? Drawing near to God. It's about purity. It's about cleansing. Okay? It's about celebration. It's about peace. Praise. Praise. Okay? Now, we're going to look at a couple of interesting terms. All right. Um, I've picked out a couple of, a couple of words that we're going, to, we're going to have to look at. All right? Why does all the sacrifices have to be unblemished? What is it? Or oh, before I get there. You saw, that, you saw that the sacrifices, as you came up to the animal, you lead the animal up and it says you will lean upon the animal. Right? That term lean upon means to press upon. So you would come up and you would go onto this animal and then at the gate you would announce your attention and in many instances the priest would hand you a knife and you would go you yourself would, would, would kill the animal. And then they would capture the blood with a bucket and then they would take it. Okay? Not a plastic bucket, but a bucket. Okay? And it's not like this. Alright? But this animal 
What, what was the purpose of me pushing on this animal? Transference. Transference, but warm. Okay, so it's a transference of what? Not just your sin. Of you. Acknowledge it yourself, yes. That it should be you that should be sacrificed for you as Transference of identity. By leaning upon something or laying hands on someone, you are identifying authority. This is going over. And we've got a couple of biblical examples of like, like this. When, um, for instance, when Moses was transferring his authority over to Joshua, he laid his hands on. Same thing with, uh, I believe, double check me on this please, or with, uh, with Aaron and his sons. God asked him to pray on it, laid hands on it. It was a transference of authority, identity that they're going into. Okay? So when I bring into this atom, this animal, for whatever purpose, I would transfer my identity on because I want to draw near to God. Alright? Let me ask you this. When was the first sacrifice, in a sense, in the Bible? Abraham and Isaac. Abraham. No, Cain and Abraham. Cain and Abraham. Adam and Eve. Right? Remember? When they got kicked out. The thing, they made fit leave closer and God said, no, 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 okay? When he kicked them out and he took an animal, died, and he made skins for clothing. This will cover you, okay? You see, it's a pretty picture. It will cover your nudity. It will cover your sin because their sin was now, we're naked. They're exposed. And he's like, we told you you were exposed. All of a sudden, it was to cover one shame. And this animal is now, through its blood, is covering you so that you again can draw near to God, even though there were consequences. Okay? So, you take... Why does the animal have to be unblemished? Why does the animal have to be unblemished? you blemished. Absolutely. Because you're blemished. You're broken. Okay? So you want to give something pure, something unblemished, something perfect to take away that identity. This is the offering. I'm giving you something pure as what you deserve. Because I am not. Is it a foreshadow of Yeshua? Absolutely. Absolutely. He was considered perfect. Not only by the, the high priest and that were they had to bring false accusers to try and trap him so that they could get him to, to be killed. Remember, they weren't allowed to kill him. They never had the authority. Okay? Remember, in that time, if someone blasphemed, you needed two or three witnesses. According to Torah, you would have to take him to the Sanhedrin. You would go to the Sanhedrin. And then you would say, okay, this is what we have witnessed, this is what the Sanhedrin would divulge. And they would say, okay, remember, they would very, be very lenient. Remember uh, in the Talmud it said if they committed, you know, I think it was one person to death within 10 years, they had blood on their hands. Okay, so this was something that didn't really happen. Okay, in Yeshua's time, there was no authority for the Sanhedrin. You had to go to the governor and he had to carry out the death penalty. Only Pontius Pilate had the authority. Rome had that authority. Okay? And when they went to him, they tried to trap him and then they said, okay, we'll find a fault. Get false, accus false accusers, false accusers. That didn't work. Pontius Pilate questions him. Okay, no, no, no. and even he came out, the gentle Roman guy. And we know what Romans believed and how they were. And he said, I find a fault with him. What, 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 what's the problem? Okay? And they actually had to blackmail Pontius Pilate, saying, oh no, well he said, you know, he, he's the king, so therefore it's, it's in direct violation to, to Caesar. And if you let him live, he would cause an uprising, and then you're no friend to Caesar. We're going to tell Caesar because you let a king sit through your cross. Someone is going to cause more issues. And remember, you went to governor in Judea by choice. It was kind of the downgrade. You wanted to be in Rome. You want it to be out, out there in the lap of luxury and civilized from now you've got to deal with these pesky Jewish people who keep on screaming about this God and oh boy, boy, what's going on in here and they don't want this and they don't, why can't you just be good subjects? It was a punishment. So to get back into the good graces of Rome, you would make sure you would do your job and you do it well. Pontius Pilate could not take the chance, otherwise he might end up being governor there forever. 
Okay, so he was like, this is messing with my political career. Sorry. They used points like that to force or push him to go, okay, well, I'll wash my hands, I'll hand him over to you. But it was Roman centurions who put him on a, on, on a piece of wood. They crucified him. Crucifixion, not invented by the Romans, but perfected by the Romans, according to Josephus. Okay? So, unblemished. All of this is going to be about Yeshua, guys. This is why we need to lay the foundation nice and think so they try to understand the point of this. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of cut, catch, sprinkle, parts, skin, poop, wash, clean, bright. Done. There we go. Everything's lovely. God loves a good bright and sins are forgiven. We need to look at this so that you understand what's going on. All right. So, sacrifice does not deal with salvation, but it deals with cleansing us. You killed it because you wanted to draw near to God. Right? 